for real fanatics, but I'm sure every artist has them. Uh, but I know them far worse than me. Um, Ian um, Presnansky has asked me to do a poem tonight, so I'm going to start with it. And it's a very new one. Um, so I'm glad you arrived in time, Ian. <laughs> um, and I want to point out, although I'm 70, this is not about me. Um, it's called How an Old Man Can Spend His Final Years. I am now old. In the autumn of my years, maybe even the winter of them, I am vastly rich. I've had a good life, no poverty, hunger or homelessness for me. I can, in a way, be smug. I could buy a Caribbean island and have fun. And whatever rest I want or I feel I need, I can go where I want, travel, enjoy life, no complications. If I am ill, the best treatment, expense, does not matter. So it can be instant. No waiting about for me lying on trolley in casualty for hours. But I like wealth and want more. A few billions is not enough for me. I like power and making folk crawl. I can call the lower classes the underclass, plebs, scum. I have thought about it. I will spend the last few years of my life making sure the underclass stays that way. No redistribution, redistribution of wealth. Our lot is keeping it all. No equality for the scum. I will keep them down with all my strength and my last breath. It will be stressful and hard. As I will be attacked by the left, I will be vilified. But I want that power. It makes me alive. It's better than sex for me. I will keep the bastards down till the moment I die. And uh, th thank you for... Um, asking me to do that. Now, to people overseas, um, we have a couple of uh, really evil, nasty bastards who have taken over from um, uh, Johnson. And um, so they're called Liz Truss and Quasi Kateng. And you need to know that. And if you imagine Trump has gone and you've got somebody bleeding worse, um, it's just, it makes us all very depressed and angry at the same time. Quateng's nonsense. A new mini budget announced by Quateng allows bankers to become richer, even richer as they fail the country and close the high street banks. And it takes the cap off the bonuses. How will that help people eat? How will that stop people freeze? Scrapping the higher rate of income tax for the rich, those not worried about heating or eating, the lowest incomes, well, not much at all. Quateng says we have thought too much about redistribution of wealth. Not so the Tories never thought about that for a nanosecond. Then they attack the unions fighting what is right, as always. Attack universal credit claimants, as always. Making them work longer or face benefits cuts when it's insane that people who work aren't allowed to work full time and can't earn a living wage. What bollocks. Instead of massaging figures, changing statistics, but not changing lives for the better, how about investing in and creating real jobs? But then, he says, if this does not work, they will borrow billions again. They will bring in more public service cuts. God help us. There's not much left. The quality of our lives has dropped, vastly dropped, with decades of cuts. People always blame the local council when the council are as poor as church mice because of the central government. He calls the past policies ridiculous. Well, we've had over a decade, a decade and more of ridiculous Tories policies. And then a third one in this little set, which are all very new. Thank you. Uh, the IMF says, got up in the middle of the night as I do. Sleepless turn TV on BBC. Smug white woman scaremongering about refugees and how many are arriving in the UK still and how they should be sent on to Rwanda, how that was legal and right. Across the bottom of the screen, in small letters while she ranted on, distracting from the truth. 
are the headlines. The IMF is closely watching the UK economy. Oh yes, the International Monetary Fund Fund. Remember then, they devalued the pound once before. They have noted the recent mini budget will likely increase inequality. Well, bloody hell, you don't need a degree to work that out. More ramblings about immigrants arriving from Mrs. Nan Nasty. While the headlines continue, Bank of England rates may well rise again. Mortgage lenders hating, halting some deals. So some poor souls can't move as they desperately want to. So while this is happening, let's rant about the cost of putting immigrants in hotels. I mean, there's no, been no big, posh, regal, extravagant expenditures recently, have there? The government are always so frugal while folk freeze and are hungry. Can't afford to live. Let's blame someone who is not yet even in the country. Labour is in front of the polls and it's taken the economy to be so dire for that to happen. Um, and it's a sort of set of, of poems, really. And every I, I have disturbed, like Clive. Clive and I sometimes talk at four o'clock in the morning. Um, and um, we... we um, uh, have disturbed sleep patterns and I put on BBC for, and it's only five minutes and it makes me so angry that I end up with a poem, you know, so uh, uh, yes. Now, I have been known to wave a book at the cameras and this one came out last year and was Stairwell Books be Best Seller of the Year. So they've let me do another one and this um, is out now and I will put the link later in. It's actually out on the 1st of November, but I've got advanced copies and it's called Iconic Tattoo. And um, uh, so I will attempt to put the link in the, in the thing. Um, it's mainly some older poems, because, of course, you, by the nature of publishing it, I compiled it 18 months ago, but I have slotted a couple of newer ones in. So this is Beautiful Me. So everything from now on is in the book. I am so lucky me. I am so attractive, sexy. And I am now 70, still have that great appeal. I know this must be so, because on Facebook, so often, I have young, beautiful and often bare-breasted young women asking to be my friend. And it's all because of my great looks and sex appeal. They tell me so. They say they want. Yes, they want to have sex. Yes, sex with me. At first, it was mainly from Asia, but now it's from everywhere. They tell me they want to meet me. All it will take is for me to send them the money for their flight or even just my bank details. I must have greatly improved with age, as I did not have this problem in my 20s, women crawling all over me to get at my body. And it's not just my body thereafter. They've seen my kind eyes, looked into them, have seen my generous soul. They've had the villages destroyed by hurricane or by vol volcanic eruptions, and they know I will just pay to rebuild them. They just Google sexy man. Now, not being totally stupid, nor yet having dementia, I block the bastards, because not only will be, they be thieves after me cash, but also they might be male, 80, syphilitic and called Stan. Of course, things can go wrong, as a friend got such a friend request from a woman he did not know, pretty and smiling. So blocking seemed to be the way to go. Turns out it was his stepsister's daughter he'd not seen for years. Oops. Now only if he was not so damned attractive too. Um, and the title um, of, thank you, you, you seem to like that one. It's just so true, isn't it, you know? Um, and uh, if I post 10 poems, Facebook tells me I'm doing too many postings and then they offer to post them themselves if I pay them. But they let all these things through and you would have thought with some sort of algorithm, when people who I don't know and are not on my friends list or I have no mutual friend, but are bare-breasted, you'd think it was, you know, um, and they call something like Randy Bambi or something, you know, you'd think uh, you'd think they could get rid of them anyway. So the title of this was about how varied I am and from a silly one, I'm going to probably the saddest one I've ever written, which again is in the book and it's George Stinney. In 1944, which seems so long ago, but it is within my sister's lifetime and just eight years before I was born in America, the land of the free, a 14 year old black boy was executed for the murder of two little girls. He was placed in the electric chair 
and had to be seated on a large Bible, used as a booster seat, he was so small. The girls were battered to death, their bodies were dumped in a ditch. The boy was George Stinney. He had spoken to them that day as they passed the house, he directed them to where they could buy, pick certain flowers. That was all that was proven. He was arrested and taken from his parents, allowed no solicitor, even though the Sixth Amendment guarantees him one, allowed no visits from his family. They could not agree on the description of the murder weapon, and there was no blood found on George. At his trial, his counsel was a white politician campaigning for election in a town full of hatred where lynching was threatened. He cross-examined no one. George was alibied by his sisters, which they still swear is the truth. Yes, this is so close in time that some of the witnesses are alive. The trial, just 81 days after the murders, lasted one and a half hours. The all-white jury were out 10 minutes. 1,000 whites packed the courtroom, not one black person allowed in. George was not allowed to see his parents until after his conviction in America, the land of the free. At the trial, they allowed discussion of rape and even necrophilia, even though post-mortems pronounced the girls to be virgins. The trial papers have disappeared. As has an alleged confession, one made by a 14-year-old boy deprived of contact with parents or counsel. They killed him with a too large hood that allowed the tears flowing to be seen. His dad was allowed to approach him and speak to him just before he died, the only family contact he had had since his arrest. This was in 1944 in America. He was buried in an unmarked grave. 70 years later, the conviction was overturned for lack of evidence for being tainted with racism. They never found the murder weapons. How could a child hide metal objects so thoroughly? He could not. A real murderer ran free while they murdered another child. This was in America. George died because he was black. If anyone can't comprehend why black lives matters, why we need to take the knee, they should research George Stinney. No one says other lives do not matter. What they say in America in particular there is good reason to fear your early death if you are black, and that should never have been and can no longer be. And uh, I get all emotional every time I read it. So um, I think the time to turn, I couldn't get further down than that. I couldn't get more depressing, could I? So um, I'm going to lighten the mood and I'm going to perform a, a poem which is nothing near as significant, uh, but it is iconic tattoo. A young man, a physio, at the hospital helping me after hip replacement, lots of extraordinary tattoos, beautiful, expensive, striking indeed. On his right inner arm, a large image from wrist to inner elbow. A beautiful lady, I look twice, seemed familiar, an iconic image of Twiggy in Piero costume from the Boyfriend film. But I thought it couldn't be, could he? He was in his twenties. He'd not know who Twiggy was, would he? So being me, I asked who it was, some bird from the sixties. So Twiggy it was, dominating his arm, and he'd never heard of her. I told him about her and her recent fame as the stylish, mature woman in the m and ads. How strange but wonderful that such an iconic image survives to be worn with pride by the young man. Well, he was interested and went off home to Google Twiggy. Then a surprise, as the icon in the new year became a dame. Now, I wonder if the physio knows. Um, and I'd got... And I just was so bewildered because, you know, not normally have a football team or Petula Clark if you're Finn, you know, and you're a closet fan or something like that. And um, uh, that was a joke, Finn, you meant to laugh. Um, anyway, um, um, and I just was so puzzled by it. I had to write about it. Um, and I've got another one called The Tattoo. 
I'm not sad anymore, said the plaque, held by the cute cartoon bird tattooed on the young man's arm. Now, I never know whether it's rude and intrusive to read messages tattooed on people's bodies. But if they don't want you to read the words and illustrations, why have they put them there so prominently in such bright colours and large letters? Being me, of course, I asked him why it was there. Oh, I'm in a band and it's one of my songs, was the reply. And knowing the people I know, that made perfect sense. So now, where should I have iconic tattoo and uh, awakening placed? Because that would seem to be the thing next, wouldn't it, for me? Um, and then um, this is an older one, which has been turned into a song for one of these CDs for the peer that I uh, I, I produce, and it's one of my favourite of the songs, and I've put it in the book. Um, and it's really from life experience. And it's called We All Know, a Pinocchio. We all know one tells lies, but not for fun, lie through their teeth, no rhyme or reason, but all the time so wearying if they're in your life, could not cope if it was the wife. There are some where if I asked the time or what it's like outdoors, I would pause and check for they lie without cause in every respect and with no respect for you. Most folk lie to get out of trouble or get somebody else into crap or to gain reward or promotion or shift blame elsewhere. The Pinocchio lies for no reasons, but because they want to be liked. They don't know that if they did not invent stories and bull themselves up all the time, that they might be liked for themselves. But it's so tiring, checking and disbelieving all the time. That really pisses me off. Don't know why they are like this, but they are. And it's not fine, not all the time. So wearying. And, you know, I have had liars in my life, very close people to me and toxic. Then this one kind of shocked my wife. She kept saying, you can't write that, as I read out the stanzas at a time. And it's called What Happened in a Field. She lay there, exposed in the sun, spread wide, having such fun. The breeze stimulated her delicate surface. She was waiting for his wonderful embrace. He approached in a state of much excitement, his senses in a state of high enlightenment. He was excited at seeing her there, unveiled in her beauty, aloof and bare. He quivered and smelt her beautiful scent. She attracted him. He knew what that meant. She was glowing with colour and waved at him. He did not think that what he was about to do was sin. He hovered around her, drinking her in. She was so lovely, fine and thin. She had everything he needed there. There was nowhere else he'd rather be, nowhere. She was so beautiful, seemed so perfect to him, fulfilled his every need to the brim. When he was ready, he entered her there. She needed the loveliness and only for her did care. Once inside, he felt he was in heaven indeed. She was supplying his every need. He felt her touch on his bare back. She really knew what she was doing. She had the knack. How glad he was that she'd been in the field so that to him, she could readily yield. He moved around and had a great time collecting the pollen that was just fine. He had freed the nectar from that lovely flower and left it to take his treasure, his hive to endower. I trust that you realised at once that he was a bee and that she a lovely, wild, red poppy. Um, and I was sat at the desk reading out, uh, writing on paper and pencil and I kept reading Eileen a line and she kept, you can't say that, you can't say that. <laughs> but she didn't know where it was going. Um, I've got a musical section in the book and uh, there are poems about Sam Cooke, Queen, Tina Turner um, and uh, uh, Finn. Uh, yes, there is one. Um, and um, but only one. <laughs> um, and uh, this is Queen Concert, Elland Road, 1982. Occasionally, I have luck, good luck and fortune smiles on me. In 1982, I was given a task, paid good money, very good money, overtime, in fact, double time and a day off in lieu. 
what was my task so grim? Security. At a concert at Elland Road, a rock concert sold out, a stadium gig packed full of peaceful music lovers who wanted to hear and see Freddie, the great Freddie, with the rest of Queen. The teardrop explodes, Joan Jett and Hart were wonderful indeed, but they were obliterated. The moment Freddie pranced on stage the strains of Flash! <laughs> Explosions and lights lit his way up on scaffolding erected as he sang. His charisma dimmed all else. I had no work to do as he transfixed the crowd. There may have been a certain mild scent in the air, but no trouble, no violence as he rocked with fat bottom girls, bow wrap, and so many more. It was the time of my life, a halcyon day indeed, no rowdiness, as people gave themselves up to his genius and beauty. All reveled in his talent, that voice, that present, the presence, the athlete in him, the wonder that was Freddie. He was surrounded by greatness as he rocked you, loved you, bit the dust with you and was your champion. The rest of the band complimented him. Brown with his big hair was magnificent, oozing genius and charisma too. A great day, so many memories. I was truly blessed and I am blessed for having been there that wonderful night. Then I've just got a few short little poems. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the book is dedicated to four young men. Um, when I was young, uh, one of my best friends died of leukemia uh, when he was 14. And another one um, ran on the rugby field when we were all playing and dropped dead. He had an undiagnosed heart condition at 14. And then two died in a car crash at 20. So the book's dedicated to them. And this is a poem dedicated to one of them. Two boys. Two boys played in the street, had fun, laid a foundation stone for a new church, posed with their trowels in the sun. Went to school together, had fun, grew older after senior school. At 14, one went on the rugby pitch, ran, tackled, collapsed, died. Had a heart condition that no one knew about. He never made 21. He had no more fun. I am 70, the other boy. The church is now weathered and old as I am. I have had so much fun and that's not fair. So why did I survive? And it's, you, you don't know, it's not fair, is it? But then um, Two little poems from a trip to London, and yes, Finn, it was to see Petula Clark in Mary Poppins. Um, damp, misery and glamour. In the glamour and rush of the West End theatre crowd, socialising and happy, £85 tickets, money well spent. A glittering shop, the window ablaze with light, bejeweled basses and teddies, tutus resplendent with net and glitter. Such extravagance and lavishness. £300, £400, and yes, £500. Frivolity and merriment. In the well-lit doorway, in front of these displays, a young homeless lad with a thin, damp blanket, shivering away. And then one from the return chair, thank you. Um, I've just seen the comment about Petula and 85 pound, but of course she only sings one song, it. she's the bird woman, does feed the bird. So uh, yes, it's quite an expensive song. <laughs> but um, on the way back, uh, we were on a coach trip and um, bracelets and buttocks. Odd, the glimpses of life you see of passing strangers on a coach trip behind two women. One holds a phone with a bright light screen. Attracts my attention in the dark, scrolls down a lot, likes jewelry a lot. Looks at gold jewelry, 40% off. Clicking a lot to buy. Then between the bracelets, buttocks, naked buttocks. Male buttocks a lot 
I didn't really get to know her, but when I think of that trip, I think of her and bracelets and buttocks a lot. And thank you very much for that. Now, this, this book, which is called Iconic Tattoo, um, <clears throat> has an, two fantastic and amazing poets doing the blurb and saying wonderful things about me. Um, and one is Ken, Kemlin Tanbape, and the other is our wonderful Finn Hall. And he does actually manage to mention his favourite Petula Clark <laughs> within the comments. Um, and so thank you very much, Kim, uh, Finn. And um, I, I'm just amazed um, and really, really amazed to get it. I was amazed to get one book out. I'm, I'm doubly amazed to get a second one. Um, and so I, I'm a very happy 70 year old, really. Um, and um, uh, thank you for everyone who bought the first one and anyone who wants to buy the second one. Um, and it's selling very well already. I've already had to put three orders in. So um, uh, anyway, um, yes, um, there you go. Petula, by the way, is 90 um, on the 15th of November and she's still bouncing around the West End stage, um, uh, that, which is quite amazing. Of course, if she was American, uh, the Americans would ticker tape parade her and... and Treat, treat her, you know, like the, the last of the um, the golden girls, Rose, who, who lived till 99, didn't she? Um, but um, in England, we just think, oh, she's too familiar. She's been around too long. And we don't do that. We don't honour people, do we? But um, that's sad. But you could, we could have street parties, couldn't we, Finn, on the 15th of November? Yeah, we could, we could. If we get her onto block, we could give her a ticker tape parade on block. That would be fine. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so I hope I timed that about right. Um, and um, thank you all for listening. And it's been a joy to do. All right. Thank you very much, Richard Harris. Thank you. Brilliant set. Brilliant.